and welcome to this edition of Capital Watch. From the left, I'm Jennifer Wagner. And from the right, I'm Abdul Hakim Shabazz. First up this week, Indiana as a purple state in this year's presidential election. Democrat Barack Obama has opened 19 offices in Indiana, while the John McCain campaign is finally beginning to get started up in the Hoosier State. Now, Jen, let me ask you, does any of this really matter, or does it go to campaign organization? I think it matters. I think uh, Barack Obama's got 90-some-odd field organizers here, and John McCain has a telephone line in the state party office. and. Uh, you know, I heard him on NPR this morning, and the guy's just cranky. I mean, he's just angry and cranky. And I, I think if it were the old John McCain, you know, maybe he would be doing better in Indiana right now, but I think they're neck and neck. But do you really think that at the end of the day, Indiana being exactly what Indiana is, the Hoosier State, that a bunch of people from Bedford and English are going to go vote for a guy from the south side of Chicago whose name sounds like Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein? Let's, let's just be honest. I don't think he's probably performing as well in southern Indiana as he is in central and northern Indiana, but you don't have to win every region of the state to win the state. And I think there's a very real possibility, especially depending on who he picks for his vice president, uh, vice presidential candidate, I'm so used to saying that uh, he may already be president, um, that uh, that could be a huge difference maker for him here. Now, the other thing, too, that I also noticed is that uh, just speaking to some of the Republican establishment, they're saying that they're not taking Indiana for granted. Uh, Rob Portman, Ohio congressman, named as possible VP for John McCain, he was in town uh, just this past week talking about, hey, would you look at the economics, et cetera, Barack Barack, Barack Obama won't match up as well as John McCain. And Luke Messer, uh, who's the co-chair, had an interesting point saying, if you if you take the state party organization, granted they don't have all the offices, but they don't need the offices because they've got one of the best Republican get-out-the-vote organizations on the ground, as Joe Kernan found out, and it's like a bunch of other people found out in some previous elections. Well, and, you know, Mitch Daniels is obviously out there in, in every region and every county working really hard, and I think that's going to benefit John McCain, but people are sick of George W. Bush, and John McCain is George W. Bush redux. All right, let's go on to our next one. All right, our next topic, the race for governor and dueling plans announced this week. Jill Long Thompson says she would use part of the state cigarette tax to help small businesses pay for health insurance for employees. While Mitch Daniels has been focusing on education, including proposing, again, to privatize the Hoosier Lottery to help some students pay for college. Abdul, the governor may be talking about education, uh, but it appears he's learned nothing from previous uh, failed attempts to privatize the lottery. Okay, first let's take, take a couple take this one step time. First of all, Jill Long Thompson talked about using the cigarette tax to provide health insurance. I thought she opposed all tax increases, so is it just a tad bit hypocritical of her to want to take the money from the cigarette tax increase and use that to pay for health insurance? I'm just here to keep people consistent. But let's get back to the issue of education lottery. No, our Democratic friends say, you know, we need to spend more money on education. Education needs more funding. And those teachers unions say they never have enough cash. So here the governor's trying to do to privatize a non-essential government function, even though I love my scratch off, don't, don't get me wrong, a non-essential government function, privatize it, and use the money to help get people through college. And so I don't understand what the problem is. Well, I think there's a, a number of reasons why people oppose privatizing the lottery, namely that a private company would probably come in. Um, and make a profit? They make a profit, but how would they make the profit? By expanding gambling and targeting, you know, potentially groups that can't afford to play more Hoosier lottery games. Um, that's a real concern. I think, again, we saw with the toll road, we sold it off for short-term gain. and, and The toll road was not it, sold. When you people was, stop oh, saying years it's, it's called a lease, you got we went to law school just like I did. There's a difference between a sale and a lease. Come on. And 75 years, uh, I'd say I'm never going to see that road back in Indiana hands. So it's a sale. Um, Eat no. healthy and you will, I promise you. You know, <laughs> I just think uh, there's a fundamental opposition right now because of all the privatization that Daniels has done. And, you know, here's an ironic point. Of all the privatization he's done, the one thing that he can point to as a shining success is the BMV, which he didn't privatize. He did it himself. So did we really need to do all that? But uh, people are sick of it. They're sick of the outsourcing and the results that it brings. And I think, you know, the Hoosier lottery thing to bring that up right now doesn't make any political sense. Ah, just outsource everything we need the government for. <laughs> Our next topic, now on to Mayor Greg Ballard's budget proposal. You unveiled a balanced budget that spends more on police and getting rid of abandoned housing, but reduces funding for the sheriff's jail and the arts and parks. Democrats, though, are crying foul. Now, Jennifer, why is it a bad idea for the government to actually spend less money this year than it did the year before? I want to say one thing before we delve into this. <laughs> no, 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 this is a nice thing. I want to say that I'm very glad that uh, Mayor Ballard, when he went to the hospital, found out there was nothing wrong with him. Um, happy that he's in good health. However, I think if the doctors looked a little closer, they might find that his heart is actually broken from having broken every campaign promise he made last year. Well, actually, uh, every uh, okay, single okay. one, okay. from hiring in lobbyists to washed up political hacks to having an open government. I mean, the man is trying to privatize the MAC without telling anybody. And the last thing he promised, the thing that he's promised time and again, 
I will not cut public safety funding. And what does he do? A $5 million cut in the jail, where the criminals go once they're arrested. So how do well, you justify that? Well, first of all, I think what you'll find upon closer inspection with the mayor's heart issue is the fact that he looked at the financial mess that the Peterson people left, and that's enough to put anybody into cardiac arrest, which would be on the hot button this week, by the oh, way. Oh, so, all right. I'll have to tune in gotta, for that. Gotta get, gotta get that line in. No, but think about it. I mean, if the you know, when it comes to funding in the jail, the, the sheriff still can't explain exactly how much uh, how much he spends. You know, on a good day at the Department of Correction, it costs 67 bucks a day to house an inmate at the private jail, 42 bucks. Now, the sheriff is costing 107 dollars, and those are based on his own numbers. Maybe the sheriff is a person who should go see a doctor, maybe take some memory pills because he's forgetting exactly how much it costs to actually run the jail. But he said that's not an accurate number, and I would argue this. Okay. You know, if, if Mayor Ballard and Sheriff Anderson want to get into a little fight, you know, political territory and turf war, that's fine. You went to law school, I went to law school. There are people you don't mess with, and that list includes federal judges. And I would not cross Sarah Evans Barker, and, you know, we just got out from under uh, court supervision for the jail. And do we really want to be cutting funding for a jail that's already brimming over? Well, here's the other thing, too, to keep in mind, that when the mayor asked every office to hold back 5% of their budget, which a lot of people did, some held back a little bit more, where they found more than $8 million in savings just to cash management alone and better handling the money, one of the offices that did not hold back 95%, oddly enough, was the sheriff. So obviously Frank Anderson is not a team player. He should be ashamed of himself. Oh, and that's your take. <laughs> Always. And now it's time to give our thumbs up and our thumbs down. My thumbs down once again this week goes to the sheriff for not being able to hold back just an extra 3% of his money to help get this county through his financial tough times. Jen? And my thumbs up this week goes to the Lawrence police officer. It's odd that I'd be saying anything kind about Lawrence. We, uh, we know how they used to be uh, fighting with each other on my blog. but. Uh, they are paying a $15 every two week fee for their take home cars and I think Indianapolis police officers should take a page from that book. And they probably will. I well, certainly hope once, they do. Once, once they get the situation figured out. That's all for this week. Remember you can get daily updates and analysis from both of us on the Capitol Watch blog. We appreciate you being with us. From the left, as always, I'm Jennifer Wagner. And usually from the right side of things, I'm Abdul Hakim Shabazz. We'll see you again next week.